Amen, amen. Have a seat. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. I've been debating in my mind whether I should make this next statement, so I guess I've debated that I will. <laughs> Why we didn't go with Ronnie's suggestion about uh, chips and salsa is he had suggested it about communion, and we said, no, we don't think we go there. So. There is a little guidance around here anyway. So. Uh, I want to give you a little medical up report on myself. Not that you're interested, but there is a reason. And uh, the reason why I want to tell you that is because um, have you ever had an ear that is plugged? And I have one that is plugged. And it drives me nuts. And so all afternoon my finger has been in my ear. And so I thought for guests tonight that it would be wise for me to share with you that why my finger is in my ear. And all afternoon, I laid on my side with uh, per hydrogen peroxide. Now, um, you pour that in, and the little bubbles go to work. <laughs> and I am familiar with bubbles in my brain. And, uh, and it, you know, it gets to the place where you feel like, well, um, it's going to clear up. And then it's that, that warm feeling, and it pops. And you go, oh. It feels so good. And so I wasn't thinking that I was going to have to tell this story. And while I was sitting over there, it plugged back up. <laughs> and so if you see my finger in my ear, that's the reason why. And normally I don't walk around with my finger in my ear, which does bring up another story. Um, I, I am hard of hearing and um, uh, sometimes selective. <laughs> hard of hearing, but I am hard of hearing. And one of the toughest places for me to listen is out in the foyer or out in the whatever we call it out there. And it echoes a lot. And so I, I can't hear. And uh, one time a good friend came up to me and this was, I don't know, four or five years ago. And uh, sometimes I'll just nod my head and say yes. And I don't know what I'm saying yes to. And he had come up to me and said, um, would you like to hear some really bad news? And I said, oh, yes, I'd love to hear some really bad news. <laughs> and he kind of rolled his eyes, and, the, and then he told me what he had said, and I said, I'm really sorry. So when you're out there, and I, I do one of these things and nod my head, just pull me aside. It's not offensive to me, and yell into my ear, and then we'll have a right communication, okay? So anyway, <laughs> anyhow, uh, turn in your Bibles to Philippians 2. We want to talk and start a new series tonight called Simply Serve, the Heart of a Servant. Philippians 2. The paradox of who Jesus is never ceases to amaze me with his humanity and his divinity. I mean, just, the guy is just so unique. How he works out of his humanity, learning, growing, enduring all the hardships of a human being, but maintains his identity with God. Now, Here's one of the things that always just kind of blows me away about the Lord is that he has this ability. Uh, I mean, he started out with everything, knowing everything. I mean, he is God, you know. And then he chooses to come to this planet, which means he loses everything. And now he has to regain it. And that's why we read in the scriptures, Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So there is a process by which Jesus had to start regaining all this knowledge. And yet he is still God, and he learns how to work through his humanity. The claims that go along with being God is synonymous with power, wouldn't you say? Ultimate power, yet remains the most sensitive being in all the planet. Now, that's another paradox. When you think about who God is and how big he is and how strong he is, and yet he is the most sensitive being on the planet. When we read about the life of the Lord, people are drawn to him like a magnet, even those who disliked him. Now, obviously, I'm reading into the text there, but I'm, I am saying to you that it seems to be that people are just drawn towards this Lord of ours. Obviously, there were lots of characteristics about Jesus that drew human beings toward him, but one stands out more than any other in my mind, and that is his servant's heart. Here is a person who is being used in extraordinary way have been granted powers to raise the dead. Now, friends, in my mind, that separates the men from the boys. You know, when you can look at somebody that's dead and says, 
come forth and they come forth, that's pretty good power. Not very many people in, in history have been able to do that. As a matter of fact, let me just share this with you. It's interesting to note that the book of Acts was written in a short amount of time, but its span of which it covered was 30 years. And when you look at the book of Acts, you'll find out that there are quite a few miracles. But if you span that out over 30 years, there are not that many. You know, and it's just interesting to note that um, uh, Jesus had this incredible ability to do certain things. And it was passed on to the apostles. But sometimes I think we just get it out of bounds of how often it really did take place. He healed the sick and he cast out demons. But he never, now notice this, he never used his powers for himself. When being tempted by Satan, all those tests were to use his power for himself. He didn't. It's the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And every one of those were aimed at the Lord for him to use his powers for himself, and he didn't do it. There is such a contrast between the Lord and his focus to remain a servant and our culture that aims to be served. You know, I've often said that the biggest problem that we have in America is upward mobility. And I've often said even about this church, the thing that scares me and concerns me the most is upward mobility. Upward mobility and yet remaining humble is quite a contrast, and yet Jesus was able to do it. There's such a contrast between the Lord and his focus to remain a servant in our culture that aims to be served. Maslow, I always want to call him Maslow, but Maslow's theory of of all human beings has a need to be a part of a hierarchy, in my opinion, is absolutely true. That we just naturally want to move up in whatever organization or whatever it is. I don't necessarily believe that's bad all the time, but I do want to point out something here. The need to have power to promote oneself to a position to gain popularity, wealth, is really antithetical to the Lord's kingdom. Remember how often Jesus would heal somebody? And then he would immediately tell them, don't tell anybody. They didn't obey him very well. But he did this for a purpose, in my opinion. He was practicing this principle to remain a servant, not to become a celebrity. As a matter of fact, I think that there's a real contradiction about the whole idea of a Christian celebrity. I don't know about that. But rather in continue to connect with people at their level. The test of failure, friends, is not the biggest test in the world. You know what the biggest test in the world is? The test of success. That's the biggest one. And Jesus was an absolute success. But he remained humble. Listen to this in Proverbs 27, 21. The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold. And each is tested by the praise that is accorded to him. In other words, it's not a big deal for us to fail, but it is a big deal for us to succeed. Because when praise starts to come our way, we have the ability to use it on ourselves. Jesus knew about the wave of his popularity. As a matter of fact, you can read this in John chapter 6. He was riding quite a a wave of popularity. I always like to point this out about the book of John. The book of John is about 11 days in the Lord's life and close to the end of it. And so he's getting to the place where everybody in Israel is really knowing about this guy, and he is making quite an impact. And it says that the people came to make him king. Now think about this. In other words, we like this guy so much that we think he's going to take over Herod's place. And it says about Jesus that he withdrew from them and went to a mountain by himself. Now, characteristically of what Jesus is going to do, because we're talking about a person here that has this incredible amount of power. Nobody has ever walked in the power that he has. And now he is going to say to his 70 and to his 12 and the other ones, I'm going to bestow power upon you. And what I want you to do is I want you to recognize this fact. That when you walk in this power, what should come through is a servant's heart and humility and not trying to gain some kind of position. You see, it is my thinking, and I don't know how clear this is, but it is my thinking that one of the reasons why the church is having less and less impact upon the society that we're in is that we have lost the credibility to speak into the culture. 
And the reason why is because the way we're going to gain that back, at least in my opinion, is that we're going, to, we're going to learn how to gain the ear of our culture by serving them. And in that process of serving them, because people, just like the Lord, are drawn towards a magnet, they will be drawn towards the church, not because of popularity, but because we've learned how to serve. Listen to this in Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. If you have your little outlines you want to follow along, let's take a look at four attitudes of a servant. Four attitudes of a servant. Number one, there are a lot more, but let me just go through these four. Number one is this. They relate to all segments of society. There were four segments of society in Jesus' day, and he remained a servant to all four of these segments of society. We must maintain a respect for all four and not be intimidated by the more powerful, but learn how to serve them as well. Let me give you these four classes. Number one is this. There was the ruling class. These were the people that were... They were real power brokers of the day. They were the celebrities. They had the money and they had the influence. And this would be like Pontius Pilate or Herod. Now, when you look at this class of people, you have to to recognize that Jesus did serve them. Even before he was in front of Pontius Pilate. He told Pontius Pilate, you know, first of all, in all due respect, you don't have any power except what was already granted to you. And if I wanted to, I could opt out of this thing right now, but chose not to. And he he served him. Pontius Pilate had some interesting questions for Jesus. Are you the son of God? And he says, thou sayest I am. In other words, yeah. You know, he he didn't have, you know, a heart that was saying, "I'm, I'm better than you. But he did have a heart that said, I will serve you. And it was at this class of people, friends, that he held some of his greatest criticisms for, which was actually serving them. So you have a class of people here that Jesus comes to that is not intimidated by, but he learns to serve him. Then right underneath that is the um, retaining class or retainer class. These were the upper middle class who enjoyed a higher standard of living than these other two classes. They identified with the ruling class. They were the chief priests. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the high council. And there's a couple of guys that I just want to mention here that were in this class that Jesus really had an effect on because he served him. Number one is this, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea was the guy that came and begged the body off of Pontius Pilate. He was a really well-known guy. As a matter of fact, the way legend says or tells us about history is that he was the guy that had the garden tomb. And that's where... Christianity, a lot of Christianity, I should say, the Protestant side of Christianity, when you go to Jerusalem and go to the garden tomb, supposedly that was Joseph of Arimathea. Now, let me just say this to you. Being of this class and having a high profile in Jerusalem, he's making a huge statement when he goes to Pontius Pilate and says, I want the body of Jesus. In other words, his faith is now becoming absolutely known to everybody around them. And in those days, they didn't want to do that. The other one is Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus? You can read it in John chapter 4, I believe it is. Somewhere around there, maybe it's 3. I always call it the Nick at night story. Because he came to Jesus at night. And he was afraid because he was on this big council deal around Jerusalem. And you'll find out that in towards the end of the Lord's life that he makes his faith really open towards people. So Jesus served those people and they recognized that he was a servant. As a matter of fact, he said, Nicodemus says, nobody could come and do the things that you do unless you're God. And like a magnet, Jesus pulls these people in. Then beneath that class, we have the working class. This was the largest class in the Agarian society. This included the fishermen, the farmers, small business owners. They paid the highest taxes. Does this sound, sound familiar? And worked the longest hours. Peter, Andrew, Philip would have been amongst this segment. And then the lower class. Now, obviously, Jesus 
picked a lot of his followers out of this class. You know, let me just say this to you. The Lord still fishes on the bottom. Aren't we glad? (laughs) And then there's the lower class. These were the expendables. Those who were non-productive or unemployed. The handicapped, the sick. They had little power or hope for the future. And Jesus spent most of his time with these. If you consider the least of these. Now, I want to show you a video here by Bono. At least just a little bit of it. And I want you, I, I want you to see this from, from one standpoint. Is because here's a man that is a real celebrity. And yet he chooses to take his power, not for himself, but to use it upon those that are the least fortunate. I want you to just take about six minutes and watch this, and I'll come back and finish what I have to say. I don't know about you, but when you look at somebody that has that kind of celebrity status and is using it to touch the poor, you can make a comparison to what Jesus came from. Talk about a celebrity. (laughs) Jesus comes from, and he says, that's where my focus is going to be. So I want us just to think about that, you know, that as we grow, that the real focus that the Lord wants us to use our lives for is to influence those that don't know him. Number two is this. Servants are motivated by serving, not status. Now, I'm going to bring this out of Matthew chapter 20. Now, I'll go through this rather quickly, but there was a mother by the name of, uh, well, she had two sons, and there's, the name was the mother of Zebedee, the two sons of Zebedee. And uh, the point of this story was, is that Jesus is now seeing some things that are really taking place in his ministry. And so she sees that there's a really good thing going on, and because two of her sons are the disciples, she comes up to the Lord, and she actually kneels down before the Lord, and she says, um, I want to ask you a favor, and I ask that you would grant this to me. And he says, well, what's that? And she said, I would like one of my sons to sit on your right side, and then I'd like my other son to sit on your left side, which is really a a statement of power. Wherever you're going to sit, I want my sons to be there at that place because I see you've got some really going, uh, good thing going on here. And Jesus goes, wait a minute. Now, friends, let me say this. It was not just about those two guys. It also goes on to say the ten others became indignant when they heard the request of the mother. And the reason why is is because they wanted those positions. And Jesus says, guys, we've got to take a time here and we've got to talk about this. So he brings them together and he basically says this. That is not the way my kingdom works. It's not about position. It's about function. And what I want you to do is I want you to function like me. And this is where we pick it up in Matthew 20, 26. Not so with you. In other words, he's comparing it to the Gentiles who lord it over them. He says, it's not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. So here's the point that really Jesus is trying to get across. What we do in our society is this, friends. The higher we go on the ladder, the more we grab identity from what we do. I don't even know that it's impossible not to do that. It's just the way that it works. It kind of goes back to Maslow and what he was saying. You know that we all have a need to climb a ladder. And sometimes, like Stephen Covey says, we recognize that we have put our ladder against the wrong wall, but we've climbed to the top, and now we're asking ourselves, what are we doing there? And Jesus is saying, guys, I don't want you to get caught in that. Now think about this. The reason why he is saying this, and I will forever preach this, is simply because he talks about Uh, John does, in this world, the world is what? Passing away. It is fading away. And so when you put your identity into a position, what's going to happen to it? It's going to pass away. When you go to a funeral and you look at Joe in the box, you don't go up there and say, that's Joe. You say what? That's Joe's remains. Why is that? It's because we know that Joe has passed away. And when we put our identity in these things of the world, Jesus is saying that your identity is going to pass away. 
And here's the real point that he's making. If you want real identity in my kingdom, there's one thing that you can do to be great. Serve. If you serve, you're great. It doesn't matter what else you do. As a matter of fact, friends, when you look at this, Jesus came as a servant, and even when we get to heaven, now, a lot of people have a lot of ideas of when the marriage supper of the Lamb is, you know, going to be and all that kind of stuff. I just want to be there. <laughs> but the point of it is, is that Jesus, even at that point, is still taking the towel and putting it over his arm and is serving. And so he's called us to serve. Number three is this. Not a status. Stewardship of a servant attitude is vital. Now, this is out of Mark. Mark 13. And I want to set this up for you because the way that Mark was written is because Jesus is talking about, as a matter of fact, the disciples even asked the question, what will be the sign of your return? And so Jesus goes into this incredible teaching about what all the signs will be before he returns. Now, the disciples have got it in their mind at this point that what's going to happen to Jesus is that he is going to leave. They understand that. And so he comes to this place, and he gives a little parable. And in this parable, he is saying, when I am gone, it really counts what you do. Now, friends, let me just say this to you. We're still in that time. As far as I know, Jesus left, and he has not returned. And if he hasn't returned, or if he has, we're all in big trouble. <laughs> You know, so he's saying, during this time, there's going to be some activities in my house, and I'd like to read this to you. No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You don't know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves, now notice this, it's like a man going away. Jesus says, I'm going away. He leaves his house. See, he leaves it. His house. We are his family. And puts his servants, who is his servants? All of us, in charge. Each with his assigned task and tells us, the one at the door, to keep watch. Now, here's the point that the Lord's trying to get. Now, I want you to see this. There, there's about four points that I would like to relate at, at, on this point. The first one is this. That when God gives a servant responsibility... Also, with that responsibility goes gifting. And, I, I, you know, I, we've talked about gifting in this church an awful lot. Every one of us have been given gifts. You know, I've said this. I don't know how true it is. But I think one of the questions the Lord's going to ask us when we stand before him is, what did you do with my gifts? Every one of us have gifts. And when he left, he gave his gifts. And he says, I have put you in charge over certain things in my house. Now, all of us know that have families recognize this truth, is that a family does not function unless every member is participating. And the Lord says, I have given gifts to men, not just a few, but to all of us. And so, therefore, we have responsibility. And then Jesus goes on to talk about, but when I come back, I don't want to find anybody sleeping. Now, that's really an interesting characteristic that Jesus would say why I'm away that there would be the tendency within his servants to sleep. Now, here's, I want to give you some ideas of what I think what the Lord is talking about. Number one is this. When people fall asleep, lots of times it's simply because they don't want to assume the responsibilities that they have. So, you know, rather than take on the responsibilities, we can pretend like we were sleeping. Kind of like when we had children and they were really young and uh, they would cry during the night, we men would pretend that we were asleep. <laughs> A few of us recognize that one, you know. And so Jesus is saying, I don't want that kind of a sermon. As a matter of fact, I could really make you feel guilty, but I'm not going to do that because I don't think that that was the motivation of what Jesus was saying. He's just saying, look, a tendency within all of us is to think, I really don't have gifts. And actually, a mentality that we deal with in this church is that it's so large, they really don't need my help. And friends, the opposite is true. The more the church builds from the inside, the more it can have impact on the outside. Every one of us have been called to do something in the church. We talked out about that as ministry. Which goes to this, this other thing about sleeping that I thought about. 
The reason why many of us will pillow our heads tonight and sleep quite soundly is because we've worked hard all day. And you're wiped out. As a matter of fact, if more teenagers had jobs all day, they would sleep a whole lot more at night. <laughs> you know? And so the idea behind this is this. Now, and this is, this is something that I think the Lord's really trying to get apart, a, a a, across to us, is this. When you work a lot, you get tired. And when you get tired over a long period of time, you neglect your responsibilities. And here's the, here's the point about the church, friends. And if we're going to be responsible about this whole idea about being good servants while he's away, is that we always have to have people in training to take our place. You know, when, when, when you leave or you don't show up and you have a responsibility around this place, the ship still has to sail. And the Lord just says, I want you to be on your guard, alert. Because there's a tendency over a long period of time just to think it really doesn't matter what I do. Which the fourth attitude that I really kind of like to talk about is this. The church is always about expanding its place to allow more people in to use their gifts. So that it keeps on going. It keeps on going. So that's a servant's heart. Is he recognizes this house that the Lord is building is really dependent upon us, we people, finding out what our giftings are and then maintaining his house. Number four is this. They have an attitude of submission. John 15, 20. Now, Jesus says this, no servant is greater than his master. Actually, there are two times in the scripture that the Lord uses this very phrase. Uh, one time is just previous to this when he's about ready to wash the disciples' feet. And he brings them together and he does this incredible act of humility by washing the disciples' feet. He knows at that time that Judas is going to be the one that betrays him. And he says, this is going to be something that I want you to do is to practice how to wash one another's feet. And so me being, you know, the top dog, as it were, I'm going to show you how to do this. And so I'm going to humble myself and do it. Now you go past this point where he does that with the uh, washing of the feet at the, at the Last Supper. And you come to this place and he's just about ready to be crucified. And he's saying, look, guys, I'm going to tell you this. Something's going to happen to you is that you're going to start following me and you're going to start finding out that people don't like what you're doing. And they're going to persecute you. And when they persecute you, remember this. A servant is not above his master. As they did it to me, so they are going to do it to you. And as I've had a right heart like it was towards Judas, so I want you to have a right heart towards those people that persecute you. Now, this is what the Lord is saying, in my opinion. You're going to go through some really difficult times. Servants go through tough times. As a matter of fact, all of us are going to find ourselves in situations where we wish we weren't going through what we're going through. As a matter of fact, I think that's exactly what the Lord was talking about, you know, that he is going to the cross. And he's going to the cross. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying for what? Strength to me. Knowing that he was coming to do this very thing, and yet he gets right to it, and it's like, this is not going to be a good day. Going to the cross. And so the point of it is, is this, is that when we come to situations in our life that we would rather opt out, Jesus says, I want you to keep an attitude of submission. Now let me tell you what I'm, I'm talking about here, friends. When I was growing up, uh, and both of my parents experienced this, and obviously I did too, they would ask me to do certain things. And uh, I would say to them, um, especially over things I didn't want to do, all right, I will do it. Remember those times, Mother? <laughs> and I'd go out and do it. Now, I did the right thing, but I did it with what? Wrong attitude. What is the Lord more interested in? You know, I always hated it when I brought home my report card because my parents didn't, you know, they did look at the grades, but what they were more important was what? My attitude. You see? 
And Jesus is saying, look, you're going to go through some really tough times. And what I'm far more concerned about, whether you do the right thing, is that you have the right attitude. Because if you have the right attitude, you'll do the right thing. And I don't know about you, friends, but every so often I need an attitude adjustment. You know, And the Lord has the ability to come along and say, I want you to maintain a servant's heart, and so we've got to adjust your attitude here. You know, this is not right. Come back in and then recognize that with the right attitude, you can endure most anything. I want the worship team to come up. And I want us to, to think about some of these things that we've talked about. It's a struggle to obey, friends. It's not an easy thing to obey. That's why I quoted the scripture earlier about in Hebrews where it says, uh, Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Is because you and I walk through this life, we're going to discover there are certain avenues that we walk down that are not going to be convenient. But Jesus says, keep an attitude that is right. And I will bless you in the end. I want you to stand with me. We're going to worship the Lord. And I'll come back and pray with you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Jesus, as we think about that song, the reason that we can sing it with such conviction is because you had a heart of a servant. The reason that we experience grace in our life today is because you took upon yourself the form of a servant and came and served us. And Lord, with all of our hearts, we want to learn how to serve. We want to know what it is to have a heart of a servant, regardless if it's in the church or outside of the church, that our light would shine, so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify you. And so I ask, Lord, as we as a church gather around these next three weeks and talk about a heart of a servant, would you grant to us the ability to learn how to serve, not only you, but one another in the community that we live in. Bless us with that, I pray, Lord, and it's in your name and everyone said. Now, before I dismiss you, to my left, to your right is a prayer room. If you need prayer for anything, don't leave here without prayer, okay? God bless you. Thank you for coming. Turn around, shake hands. It's a nice thing to do, okay? <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>